Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Good morning. Um, by way of explanation, um, you saw from the signs outside that uh, we're, we're actually taping this for the Science Network um, for later availability on our website. And I just wanted to give you a, a brief commercial and explain to you what that is. It's a, a fledgling venture, but the, the idea, as you can see, is to that the, create a sort of a no-spin zone for science on issues that intersect with social policy. And so it's a kind of a C-SPAN for science, free from the tyranny of the soundbite, which is the sort of thing that I used to inflict on people in making PBS series. Um, uh, brain, mind, consciousness is not exactly the kind of thing that, we're, that we've been doing. We, we actually did a couple of symposia on stem cells. We're doing something on aging. We'll be doing something on addiction and so on and so forth. But it seemed that this was such a generic um, subject in looking at the whole background in evolutionary terms and in individual differences in consciousness and so on, that this was certainly a subject, subject that we should and, and would um, cover. So um, if you want to find out more about us, that's the URL. You'll find that there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of pages there that explain some of the programs that we've already done. You can download the Stem Cell Symposium. Uh, you'll find out a list of the, of the advisors that we have, including, I see, Paul McCready, who's in the audience somewhere. Um, and future kinds of programming that we're planning to do, things like a, a, a sort of a science week in review, things like uh, inside the actor's studio, except have a scientist explain what their passion is, um, so on and so forth, science book TV. Um, so um, we always say this at the beginning of the symposia, <laughs> that, um, and in fact, on the stem cell one, that's exactly what we did. We did the science in the morning, then in the afternoon, we had an ethics panel, international implications panel, e economic and, and political implications. We won't be doing that today. Uh, but the, the, the fact remains that we uh, subscribe to this, this um, nostrum of, of Moynihan's that everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. Now, uh, uh, Sherma um, asked me to do a couple of things. One was to, to show some video clips. Second was to remind you that um, science can claim to be perhaps the, the quintessential self-correcting process, and I'd like to illustrate that with a personal story. And finally, I want to make a comment about the, the importance of individual differences when we move into the kinds of science that are implicit in the subject of this conference. Uh, the last time I was up here and doing this with Michael was in late March 1996, and the subject of that conference, in fact, I don't know if any of you are here, was evolutionary psychology. And some of the speakers uh, included uh, Don Simons, um, and I need to put this slide up just, just to remind you that when I talk about evolutionary psychology, uh, or EP, I'm actually talking about a very specific paradigm, a specific school of folks who were the original theoreticians um, people like Lita and John from UCSB and Don, David Buss from the University of Texas who does a lot of stuff about sexual preferences, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson from McMaster who um, uh, look at the um, childhood infanticide, uh, and then there's the, uh, the accompanying journalists, Bob Wright, uh, The Moral Animal. You probably know Matt Ridley's books, The Origins of Virtue and Nature via Nurture, which has just been republished as The Agile Gene. Um, and then, of course, um, Steve Pinker, the most extra extraordinarily um, best-selling and uh, successful of the uh, people who, who do EBPSYC. Um, I think uh, I could probably reasonably claim to have been on that list in 1996 because I'd just created a, a four-hour primetime series for PBS called The Human Quest, which was, I think, the first lengthy television experience uh, uh, ex examination of EP. Um, although probably not an examination, it was more of a valentine, I think. As Shermer put it in a review, it was nothing short of adulatory in canonizing the doctrines of this new science. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, the, uh, the Bible of the new science was this one, The Adapted Mind. Some of you may know it by um, Leader and John and Jerry Barkow. And in this book, I think this is what's, what appealed to me about it was that it set out a very strong Darwinian and uh, adaptationist position. Uh, this is a, just a cover from a magazine that, alas, is defunct. Uh, it was published by the AAAS at one point, and I confected in for this magazine Darwin's last interview, as you can see, which was conducted 100 years after his death, which I thought would also appeal to Sherman. 
Um, I used to call the process channeling Chuck. And um, actually, most of it was woven from his uh, autobiography and, and the letters. And Barnes and Noble, some of you may have known, have actually just published um, a new version of, of Darwin's autobiography. And there is a slight mistake in it. This audience, I expect, will pick it up, and certainly Michael will. Um, That is Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, not many copies of these left, by the way. I actually saw this in a bookstore with Ramachandran, and we both got one immediately. said, are there any more? <laughs> Stick these away immediately. <laughs> so, um, and uh, let, let's just try and set up this, this whole notion of uh, natural selection and adaptationism. There is a clip which is about to come up. Um, it's not short. It's, it's about four or five minutes. But it, I think it does um, a reasonably good job of explaining some of this subject. So I'll, I'll pick it up after this clip. Boom. Ah, ah, boom. Ah, ah, boom. Ah, ah, boom. Every healthy infant comes with a basic survival kit. Mechanisms of the mind, like a language instinct, are standard equipment for human newborns. Now, how does that happen? Well, making minds involves the same process as making bodies. Any body at all. And how is that done? Well, the answer wasn't uncovered using modern brain scans. It came the good old-fashioned way from two 19th century scientists whose principal tools were the microscope and the butterfly net. To a generation used to space travel, the tall ships that took 19th century scientists on their voyages of discovery seemed quaint and old-fashioned. But the riddle those scientists solved is at the heart of a thoroughly modern revolution in our understanding of the human mind. The riddle? How did living things change over time? What explained the existence of everything from beetles and butterflies to human beings? That was the mystery of mysteries in the 19th century. The story of its solution and its continuing impact on how we understand our brains begins with a Welsh naturalist named Alfred Russell Wallace setting sail for the islands we now call Indonesia. Wallace made his living collecting birds and butterflies and beetles and selling them to institutions, so he was in daily contact with nature's incredible inventiveness, the profusion of species. And he asked the question, where do they all come from? On the island of Ternate, in between the hot and cold parts of a malaria attack, he had a sudden flash of insight and saw the solution. He wrote a 20-page letter and mailed it to the one man in the world he thought was capable of judging its merit, the more famous half of our story, Charles Darwin. arrived here at Darwin's home in the little village of Down, just south of London. Why don't you come in? Darwin and Wallace were regular correspondents. In fact, this little box of bees was sent by Wallace to Darwin from Indonesia. But it was the letter that arrived that day in 1858 that was the real stinger. You see, Darwin had reached essentially the same conclusions almost 20 years earlier. But for various reasons, including not wanting to offend almost everybody, had decided not to publish his revolutionary ideas. So now, just as he was finally beginning to put something down on paper, it seemed as if Wallace had scooped him. Darwin's response to this long-distance wake-up call was to write this book, The Origin of Species. The cornerstone of the origin is the idea of evolution by natural selection, 
step by step over millions of generations, natural selection has fashioned complex organisms from the simplest of beginnings. Essentially, it works like this. There are random variations in the individual members of a species. A slightly different eye or different thumb here, a different shape of beak there. Some of these differences give their owners a slight edge in Mother Nature's school of hard knocks. So they survive and reproduce more successfully than their competitors. And those variations are inherited, passed on in the genes. Over time, a new eye may emerge, better at detecting objects. Or perhaps a new beak, better at gathering food. These adaptations, as they're called, may look as if they were designed to solve problems. But as Darwin and Wallace realized, natural selection, by preserving and accumulating chance advantages, was enough to do the job. It's a breathtakingly obvious idea, once it's pointed out to you. And it's the basis of what might be called the first Darwinian revolution. For all its fame and for all the fuss it caused, the origin has almost nothing to say about people. Except in the final few pages, where Darwin can't resist dropping a hint of things to come. In the distant future, he says, I see open fields for far more important researches. Psychology will be based on a new foundation. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. The basic argument is as follows, that um, our bodies are collections of natural selection's greatest hits. So we've got hearts specialized for pumping blood, livers specialized for removing toxin, hands with opposable thumbs specialized for grasping, eyes specialized for seeing, and these are adaptations. Now, in the same way, evolutionary psychology, the EP folks, claim that our minds must also contain cognitive adaptations, which are information processing circuits that evolved in response to the same selection pressures that our ancestors encountered in the Pleistocene in order to solve survival problems. And those survival problems would be things like face recognition, mate choice, cheetah detection, and so on. These are the categories that they give. And so they, they actually postulated an, a, a confederation of what they claim to be hundreds or possibly thousands of genetically specified domain-specific modules, as they're called, sometimes also called in the literature instincts, or mental organs. Um, and in fact, in the literature, they go as far as to say that, to remind us that William James used to talk about a proliferation of instincts, that humans should have more instincts than other animals. Uh, William McDougall said the same sort of thing. So the, the idea of instincts is very much in, in the, the terminology of EP. And you remember Stephen Pinker's first book was actually, second book was called The, the Language Instinct. Um, there was also some acknowledgement that uh, the mind might contain some domain general mechanisms and some integrative circuitry, but the, the real heavy loading was to be done by these modules, um, which could be conceived of as sort of mini computers, each um, designed, dedicated to solving one problem. So the second point was that the brain, after all, does have these um, areas specialized for solving adaptive problems. So if we have, in a sense, a modular brain, why not have a modular mind? And this marriage of adaptationism and modularity is perhaps the defining characteristic of the EP enterprise. Uh, there was another claim that followed from that, uh, which I'll get to in a second. They, they also talked about an env environment of evolutionary adaptedness. That does not mean a specific place or time, but that means um, a statistical averaging of environments in which traits became fixed. And that would they'd be different for all kinds of traits. Um, there was another claim that followed from that, and that, that's the sort of, uh, the, 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 this endowment of instincts constituted a universal human nature. So on this view, the cultural differences were simply variations on a theme, locally produced rifts on the psychic unity of humankind, and supporting this notion was the, the argument from Gray's Anatomy, uh, which you can see here, so that just as you can have open uh, Gray's Anatomy and find 
what appear to be species typical universal physical traits that you could find the same sort of thing in the cognitive realm. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but there are some objections to it. Um, you probably noticed that uh, at the beginning of the video, uh, in keeping with the EP gospel, I confidently assign to every human infant a great deal of built-in circuitry like a language instinct. That was before I knew better. Um, and this, of course, speaks to the ancient debate variously called it different levels of analysis, nature, nurture, or genes, environment, nativism, empiricism, innate versus learned. Uh, I actually don't want to get bogged down on this um, because I think we all... <laughs> I think we all assume now that most thinking people know that the versus actually sets up a misleading dichotomy and um, that the correct answer is all of the above in some as yet imperfectly un understood combination. However, the EP position actually tends towards the nativist end of the spectrum. And I was going to play uh, a clip now um, showing Steven Pinker. Um, I'm not sure if I should even leave and see whether it works, but let's try it and see what it, how this comes out. The things that any normal human being can do unconsciously without thinking are some of the hardest engineering problems that have ever been stated. And you don't get that from a lump of wax or a blank slate. There's just no alternative to thinking about the complex wiring that the genes put into place in order to understand how we can do these, uh, these magnificent abilities. Unlike what Steve said there, that there is actually is an alternative. Um, and in 1996, uh, I had the great good fortune to be listening to the ideas of Peggy Lacerra, who was a postdoc in the EP Capital, the laboratory of John Tooby and Lita Cosmides. When Michael said that I authored The Origin of Minds, he meant co-authored uh, co it with Peggy. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, she became convinced that uh, the EP folks had got the wrong story. And at a meeting later that summer, there was the Human Behavior and Evolution Society meeting in Evanston, Illinois. Um, she gave a presentation of ideas, uh, which largely because it was full of EP royalty fell on somewhat deaf ears. And shortly afterwards, uh, invited me to collaborate with her. And, uh, uh, we, we published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, The Adaptive Nature of the Human Neurocognitive Architecture and Alternative Model. And uh, we then published a trade book uh, called The Origin of Minds, becoming in the process, as Michael put it, um, evolutionary psychology revisionists. I don't necessarily recommend this, by the way, you lose an awful lot of friends. I have... <laughs> Uh, the core of the argument was, as Peggy put it in a, in, in a recent paper, that the first law of psychology is the second law of thermodynamics. In other words, the primary adaptive problem any organism must solve is entropy. You've got to keep your bio bioenergetic bank balance in the black. Uh, and the hallmark of animalian intelligence systems is the capacity to predict the likely costs and benefits of alternative behaviors. So to navigate a biological marketplace, in constant flux, you don't need to evolve a separate, genetically specified collection of brain circuits, modules, or instincts for each adaptive problem domain, in our view. What you actually need is an adaptively flexible intelligence system that can respond online to changing environmental conditions and by functioning as a predictive cost-benefit analysis system figure out and tell you whether life's getting better or mo worse in the moment, keeping entropy at bay. So in other words, the selection pressures would have driven the evolution of a functionally plastic neural substrate, which you all have up here, called neocortex. So the neocortex is the, the adaptation that we're looking for, not this bundle of instincts. Um, and we also talk about adaptive representational networks, which are the representations that you build up as a database in your neocortex. They're yoking together information about the environment, uh, about your internal state, uh, about behavior that we, you perform, and about the outcome of that behavior, uh, which is calibrated, uh, registered by the ascending monoamines, serotonin, so on and so forth. So um, the creation, uh, this, this, uh, this is all uh, mediated, modulated by the life history regulatory system. Um, which deals with 
how things go along at different stages of your life. It's basically a hormonal system, which is, which is uh, calibrating and generating um, life stage responses. Um, I could have put up some scientific slides at this point, but I thought these were going to do a more, more interesting job. And, and, and it, you know, we talk about the creation and deployment of ourselves, how big we should be in any given social situation, any biological marketplace, how we upregulate and downregulate our size, as it were. There's a chapter in The Origin of Minds um, called What Size Should We Be? It, Alice's, uh, we're talking about Alice's adventures in Wonderland there. Um, uh, you, you also, uh, we also talk about the, um, the importance of, uh, of the family environment in which you're growing up and constructing your self-representation, uh, and the importance of, uh, of peers. <laughs> um, Frank Soloway, you probably remember, did a lot of work on, on firstborns and laterborns and so on. We have a different explanation for that, which is actually in the old PNAS paper. And, of course, Judith Rich Harris did a whole book about um, explaining that uh, peers are more important than parents. In fact, we take some issue with that in the sense that it's, it, it's whoever is getting you the goods at any point of your development that is a key player in your marketplace at that time. So this, this can vary enormously and individually. Um, I, I, uh, I, explore, I, you know, I, I invite you to explore uh, further some of the primary sources. <laughs> Um, you can go back and look at David's, David Buss's work on sexual preferences and so on and so forth and then read some of the new books that have come out. There's a nice book by David Buller called Adapting Minds, which came out literally in the last month. Nice review of it in the Wall Street Journal by Sharon Begley, in which a lot of the, the factual, the statistical evidence, the surveys that were being done by the, by, by the EP paradigm are, I think, fairly convincingly at least argued with, if not completely refuted. So I invite you to take a look at those as well. Um, there's one thing I'd like to uh, return to. I, I should also mention in passing that uh, one of the other books that came out at about the same time as The Origin of Minds, which uh, also is a refutation of that position, because it comes from a, a, a theoretical computational, uh, uh, from a computational neuroscience perspective, which is significantly lacking in the EP standard version um, because they didn't really seem to have much in interest in, in how all these circuits that they were postulating could possibly be instantiated in actual neural tissue. When you start looking at the neural tissue, um, the story becomes very much more different. You're working at a completely different scale, and it's a much more fine-grained scale than postulating an entire area that's dedicated to um, some particular cognitive problem-solving domain. Um, if you look again at the title, the cover of The Origin of Minds, um, you'll see that the subtitle is Evolution, Uniqueness, and the New Science of the Self, which is a little bit over the top, but that's what publishers like. Um, but... but, but uh, the importance here was getting to the notion of individual, and you'll see that a, a, a clever designer here is trying to represent that concept by making one of the hemispheres a fingerprint. Um, the system that we've been talking about actually is, uh, if you, again, I say, if I invite you to read Peggy's um, um, latest paper plus the, the two that we, the, the book that we did here. Um, the system that we're talking about automatically generates individual differences. And I think that, this, that the whole notion of the psychology of individual differences is going to be increasingly important in many of the kind of sciences that we're talking about here. It generates kind of messy experiments in having to, having to try to figure out exactly what is going on. But it does seem to me that you, you, what lies under the, the broad swath of the bell curve is not always, given the design of experiments, going to be the best information that you get. And a lot of the information is often in the tails of these curves in individual differences. Um, that's a point I'd like to take up with the other speakers, to particularly to find out if any of them is aware of any supportive evidence for the strong EP position, um, and to discuss things like, uh, for example, the, we know that there are some areas of, of, of cortex that are uh, dedicated, apparently, to certain processing functions, for example, um, Nancy Canwisher, Canwisher has, has called the fusiform face area specialized for face recognition. And if that's damaged, to, to what extent is the ability to recognize faces lost? But does that mean we have a heritable, reliably developing module for face recognition? 
or is our intelligence system actually constructing these circuits during development so that we end up with a cortex that seems to have evolved modules, but in fact is nothing of the sort? So, as I said at the beginning, science is a kind of a self-correcting process, however painful that can be, and it was certainly somewhat painful in completely shifting my views, 180 degrees. Um, uh, uh, this, I, <laughs> I, I forgot to mention that this is one of the... Uh, this, this, uh, this, this should have accompanied the remarks about face recognition. Um, this is obviously somebody with a highly developed fusiform face area. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, I end with these, these notions of, of um, Thomas Henry Huxley's that uh, the great tragedy of science, um, they seem to be a little bit in conflict if you think about this. The great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And then he also in, in, invites you to sit down before facts as a little child and be prepared to give up everything. So perhaps the, the, the ugly fact that actually slays a beautiful but incorrect hypothesis actually does have a beauty of its own. Um, and the reason I call these remarks a un apprendo uh, is from this etching by Goya. This was done, this is a self-portrait, a, a lithograph by Goya, done when he was 80 years old. And he just learned this, this technique of lithography. And he made this wonderful illustration of himself on his old sticks, just with his long beard, just still hobbling along, but still learning. And that's the way I feel about uh, minds in this case, in my own particular case. Um, I, I wanted to finish again with, a, with another clip. Um, <laughs> so, so Let's at least try that, and if not, I'll simply tap dance for about 30 seconds on the stage. So. The moon still enchants lovers, even though we have walked on her surface. A rainbow is still one of nature's delights even though Newton explained its optics centuries ago. And we still marvel at the birth of a child, even though we know the structure of DNA. To explain is not to explain away. To many scientists, their passion to know has a workaday holiness. They speak of moments of almost transcendent pleasure as they make discoveries. Some of them invoke metaphors of the divine. Einstein believed in the god of the philosopher Spinoza, one who reveals himself, he said, in the orderly harmony of what exists. Perhaps that is the best definition of the way of science, a search for order and harmony. And perhaps that is the ultimate Human Quest. Um, perhaps it's not, but we can discuss that later in the day. Um, thank you very much.